And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, <coughs> and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from DWD Studios, Creator, creators of the multitude of games in the D100 Lite family, as well as the old the old school meets spy fiction known as White Lies, which is which is not presented, to, which is certainly in pursuit of Her Majesty's Secret Service. Sorry, <laughs> had to. The one and only Bill Logan. How you doing today, man? I am doing great. It's yeah, a long I introduction for me to just say, yeah, I'm doing great. What are you drinking today? Um, Castle Danger. Castle Danger. Well, I am embarrassing myself by admitting that since I'm low-carb dieting, I'm drinking something horrible called Bud Next. Never heard of it. Yeah, it's horrible. It's my first time trying it. I bought a 12-pack of it. I, it's zero carbs, so I thought I'd try, and I'm like, it's worse than like a White Claw. Castle Danger is a is a cre is a uh, cream ale a lo a local one. I tend it's one of my go tos because it goes down smoother. Mm, sounds delightful compared to this. <laughs> uh, that at that end, I I ran I ran out of the usual Irish whiskey. <laughs> uh, and well, getting getting mead is get, is going to be hard this time of year. That's I usually only am able to get that during the summer months. Mm, I had mead over the holidays. A friend of mine brought some over. It was amazing, sweet and thick, syrup like. Whenever, whenever the holidays come around, there's always that one person who tries to offer me eggnog, and I tell them absolutely not. Yeah, I prefer not to mix my alcohol with my dairy, thank you. You know, there there are some people who are trying who are trying to mix milk and Pepsi over the holiday season. I'm like that's the kind of thing that should get you flogged. Yeah, I remember that from like Laverne and Shirley days or something. That's that's horrible. I tried it way back then. Yeah, it's a, I I enjoy <laughs> I enjoy milk. Of of all kinds, except chocolate milk, because of, because of my issues with chocolate. Uh, but I don't know what issues you have with chocolate, but that sounds un-American. Um, allergies. It, I'm allergic to the cocoa bean. Oh, that's weird, but okay, noted. But mi but mixing th but um, mixing that with any sort of carbonation just sounds like a just sounds like a recipe for disaster. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't sound like your stomach's gonna like that too much. Any dairy at all with anything bubbly or alcohol sounds horrible. Also, also here's a here's a really bad idea. A bartender as an be who who that's his cover for what his real job is an alchemist. There you go. <laughs> like what? I'm not. Sh I don't know what. I don't know why fantasy writers haven't made that connection of. Somebody who mixes the drinks in taverns and somebody who mixes drinks in yeah. an alchemy lab. Yeah, mixologist slash alchemist. It's just it's dual, just that dual class. I mean, I mean, there's 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 already talks. There's already the whole thing about how dwarves will get in fights over who over who makes better beer. So why so why not? <laughs> but. I'd like to get into the origin story, if you will. What was sure. your what was your introduction to role playing games, and how did it stick? So, I was a teenager in high school, and there was a library in in my town that had a basement, and it had this room that you could reserve, and there was a science fiction book club there, and I. At the time, I read science fiction books. I enjoyed them. Um, and so I decided to go there and just see what it was see what was going on there. And when I got there, they weren't 
really talking about science fiction books. They were playing a game called called Star Frontiers. And so I played Star Frontiers, and I had a blast, and I enjoyed it, and I loved it. And o over the next year, eventually, the people that ran the book club ended up quitting uh, because they, they moved on to go to college or whatever. And so I ran it, and it prospered, and we just kept running. It was just one game. It cost me 10 damn dollars, and it was all I needed, right? Mm -hmm. You ever play it? Uh, Star Frontiers, yes. And, yeah. Uh, and I... A, f a few years ago, I did a I did a ser a um a series in my re in my review collection called TSR Month, where mm -hmm. I decided to cover a handful of TSR games that weren't D and D, because mm -hmm. I because I felt that there were certain ge there were certain gems that weren't talked about, and one of them was Star Frontiers, which I liked, and I also said maybe maybe that Buck Rogers game would have done better if it was used as a Backdoor second edition for Star Frontiers. Yeah, Instead, yeah, I enjoyed that the the Buck Rogers game. That was good. It was it was. All, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and say it was bad. It's just a hacked version of AD and D in in a lot of places. Exactly. But who the hell was gonna know was gonna know who Buck Rogers was in 1988? Uh it wasn't that far removed from the TV series. Come on, <laughs> it was far. Rem with with the with the with given given how stuff like Flash Gordon and and Star Wars were were the were the were a large part of the conversation by that point when it comes sure. to space opera I think I honestly think it, I honestly think it would have been a bit a bit too removed mm -hmm. um but I do I do feel that it would that it would have had a better sh that Buck Rogers would have had a better shot if it wasn't if it was using that D100 approach instead of trying to force feed um, space opera into a system that in order to make space opera work you've got to hack the holy hell out of it. Yeah, that's valid. And well, uh, well, there's obviously there's going to be some who will say, well, you can just you can just reskin you can just reskin stuff. My philosophy has always been. House ruling is a spice, and I don't know. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't. But I wouldn't want a di a dish that's nothing but cinnamon, or or nothing nothing but cumin. <laughs> like that just that just sounds un that just sounds unappealing. And I had to deal with a hell of a lot of house ruling in my with my days with GURPS. <laughs> not not with GURPS with um, riffs. I don't know why I thought of GURPS. I, well, I, I mean, we, you know, we all house ruled. I mean, that was just the nature of the beast back then. We, well, we you know, we were kids. We bought mm -hmm. one game. I had, you know, one box that had a couple of books in it. So, you know, it didn't cover every condition, every situation. You had to, you had to make up rules on the fly. You had to house rule things, and and over time, you, you the players, you know. Ex explored everything there was worth exploring that was detailed in the book, so you 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 had to create and uh, pretty soon the only thing that resembles the original game is the fact that you're still a dralocyte of Rusk flying around in an assault scout. And I'm I'm perfectly fine with with house ruling. I just I I'm just not a fan of when some designers use it as a get out of get out of jail free card. That's the reason I pick I pick on riffs so much because. Trying to run riffs as is is an absolute mess. <laughs> I don't know. I I ran riffs for a while. Um, we had a good time with it, I guess. It just never felt like a long campaign style game. It was always just, hey, let's play a game of rifts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, felt the same way about Marvel superheroes role playing game. That game from TSR it was a gem. Which but which one? They did two. I'm talking about not the basic early one but the one that came out right after it so it was uh it was you know uh face rip for the yeah. ability scores and the i mean the the initial one was too but it was like the basic game and then their advanced game came out and that's mm -hmm. the one i bought well the, we played that one many times but it was never more than just an adventure never a campaign i'm always remind the the four ge the four games that I that I ended up I ended up covering when I did when I did TSR month were 
Star Frontiers, and a bit a bit of talk about Alpha Dawn, that sister game that sister game that it had. Sure. As well as how I I missed the cleaned up versions that were that were made by fa by fans until the powers that be shot that down. Yeah, I was one of those fans. I was making the Star Frontiersman. Mm -hmm. That was me. Yeah. Um. Oh, well, small small world on that front. Um, yeah. I do I do remember ha I do remember hacking um Star Fr Star Frontiers because to um to do something akin akin to Fantasy Star because I because I'm a fan of that. I never mm -hmm. I never finished that project, but it was the first of of my it was I won't say it was the first, but it was another example of me trying to bring in th bring in things into tabletop that that some folk think think that I shouldn't. <laughs> um because I would he I would often he I would often hear if you if you want something that's like the video game just play the video game and I'm like yeah but yeah but I don't I've art but I've but what's the, but it, this is a case of I I want to bring people in who have a have more of a video game background yeah like sure it. it's a good way to attract people but also you know who gives a shit where you what your uh, you know what your muse is like. I played Mass Effect. The story was, story was fantastic, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not be in, in, inspired by that to develop something for a and an RPG? There's plenty of people who've done it mm -hmm. to the point to the point that if an official Mass Effect TTRPG is ever made, it's got stiff competition. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Uh, and, and one of them that was using the Fate Engine almost got almost got put into <laughs> to the. To the nomination for the Origins Awards until the eleventh hour, where they realized, wait, we can't, wait, this shouldn't be in. This isn't licensed. We can't do this. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know how it happened, but I, I remember seeing that, and I was like, wait, wait a minute, I don't remember an official one. Then I see it's using the Fate Engine. I'm like, oh, oh, I know this one. <laughs> yeah, I downloaded that. <laughs> um, the, uh, but there, there was. There was Star Frontiers, which I covered. There was um, Dragonlance Fifth Age, one of the two games that used the the card based saga oh, yeah. en saga engine. That, that wasn't so bad, really. Um, let's see. There there was a um, a cleaned up version of Marvel Superheroes called Nth Edition that I came, that I came across, and that that one I covered. Um, Although I did, although I did shout out um, C, um, CSH, uh, not CM, uh, um, C, um, CMF, sorry, um, Classic Marvel Forever for just being a treasure trove of material for Marvel Phase Rip. Absolutely, and it's bookmarked when, right here on my on my computer. You can't see it, but I'm pointing at it. And when the when that um, attempt at doing a revamp of Top Secret came out, I co I covered that. That was. This was 2019 when I did when I did all this. Yeah. Um, and you talking about that New World Order one that yeah. that, that came out from that new TSR group? Yeah, that's yeah, that's I, the one. You know, as someone who published Covert Ops and wrote it and White Lies and wrote it, you know that I love spy RPGs, right? Mm -hmm. I just couldn't couldn't get my hands around the New World Order game. I don't know why. It just didn't didn't ring with me. I, I have it. I, I bought the I hope bought the whole box set. It's sitting right here on my shelf, and I still I still haven't got it to the table. I've read the whole thing. I just can't I can't. And truth be told, I w I was considering covering covering the likes of Top Secret SI, which is the which is the preferred version of Top Secret for me personally. Me too. Or, it's excellent. I mean the original the original is nice, but it's a bit messy. SI fe <laughs> SI feels a bit um a bit better organized. Yep, agreed. The skill system's a little wonky, but it's good. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I thought of covering Boot Hill, but I realized both of those are still both of those are still D one hundred games, and I've already got a D one hundred game that I'm covering. So I didn't I didn't want to double dip. Huh. I mean, boot. I mean, yeah, yeah. Obviously, they're not exactly the same beyond beyond that, but. I was aiming for variety when I was do when I was doing this, but you know, you know. Speaking of that, it's kind of funny to me. 
people get hung up hung up on you know d20 versus d100 versus you know whatever 3d6 for I've, I've i've actually had reviews if you scroll through the reviews on drive through mm -hmm. um where people have said three stars uh, I like it. The only thing I don't like about it is that it's using a D100 system when D20 systems are more accurate. Oh, oh yeah, those things like I, that. Um, and, and I just don't get that. I, I'm like, okay, let me divide everything by five <laughs> to make you fucking happy. I don't know. I don't. I don't get. I don't get it either. The only the only time that I've ever gotten on a, a game's a game's dice system is when I is when I felt that it didn't support what it was trying to do. Sure. And the last time that I got that I did that was a so, was um nowadays it's Sword Chronicle, but at the time it was a Song of Ice and Fire. Mhm. Mm and the big problem that I had that I had with it oddly enough wasn't the fact that it was using a D6 pool because there's nothing wrong with that, but that for the resources that you have for character creation and advancement, there's too many attributes. Mhm. Mm because I, th I think it had like eight a eight attributes, and that's not even getting into the the skill list. That's too. <laughs> and when you have a limited number of ca of essentially character points, trying to split that among eight attributes, it even if you say that you don't that you don't have to put points in into some of them, people are gonna want to try and do as even a spread as possible. That's just human nature. Sure. Uh, it was. I it always was try. I always try to make the the number of attributes don't really bother me. I mean, I enjoyed Champions, the you know the hero system, mm -hmm. and it had what eight or something like that, ten. I don't know. It had a whole metric ton of them, but uh, you know, for if if you want a light experience, number of attributes kind of matter. I think the the pro I think the problem that I had that I had with it was uh, was that combination of a li of a limited pool to distribute and so many so many points of distribution. Mm -hmm. And even and even with that, I'm I'm I've never I've always I've always been kinda iffy about ga about games where the de where the where crit where criticals only where criticals only matter in combat and nowhere else. Yeah. And that that was that was was that another one of its failings? Um, I don't want I don't want Song of Ice and Fire was not was not bad, but I felt but I felt like it was it was not what it was not living up to its potential. I can't say I've ever played it. I I think I have like a digest size book that is like a fate version of it or something. Yeah, I was I was covering the official one from Green Ronin. And I, I, I don't can't, know where I got that book. I can't even find it right now. I'm looking through my shelves. I, I can't even say it was bad because Green Ronin does not make bad games. I agree. Just, no, just less good. Oh. Although it's funny, we it's funny we mentioned Marvel earlier because one of the things I have covered in the past is the redheaded stepchild of Marvel RPGs, which is. Uh, Marvel Universe. That one time. So that, that, that one that came out very briefly, and there were some cards or something to support it with all the no, characters that, on. No, that was Marvel Adventure Game. That was that oh, was done okay. by TSR. I I never played any Marvel game other than the original Marvel Superheroes Advance game from the eighties. Yeah, that was uh, that was obviously the first, but there's been a, there's been a few others. In fact, Marvel has had a more interesting history with RPGs than um, DC has. Because DC only had one. Yeah, I have that. Oh. It was a little clunky, but it was good. I mean it did it did get a it did get a six it did get a follow up and all but name called Blood of Heroes, but by that point the damage was done. <laughs> um but the but um the Marvel Adventure game was the other game that used the the saga system, same as Dragon. Oh, Legend. I remember now. Yeah, um, yeah, I remember. Marvel that. Universe was that one time that Marvel themselves thought that they could try and make that they could make their own RPG with blackjack and hookers. Okay, maybe not the blackjack and hookers, 
but have it be a diceless game that used ch- that used um essentially ch- essentially chips and they put this uh, they put this out in the er- in the early 2000s which was the worst time to put it out because one they put it they put it out a year after D&D 3rd edition came out Mm-hmm. And two, this was right in the middle of the legal shitstorm that Marvel was going through at the time. Um, spe- I'm specifically referring to the uh, to the parties that were involved in dealing with the bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. Spe- so you had a, you had a you had this massive ownership fight between um, Ron Perelman, Carl Icahn, um. Ike Perlmutter, who owned Toy Biz, the ba- the bank sy- the bank syndicate, the judge who was presiding over the case, and the trustee that the judge appointed to watch o- to watch over the parties. And when I say this was a shitstorm, I I mean there was open hostility between parties every time <laughs> they had to meet. <laughs> that's. So you so in that kind you of you know climate, that's a that's a pity for something that defined a whole hobby genre, right? Yeah. Um I usually I usually have people refer to the docu series that SF Debris did called The Rise and Fall of the Comic Empire to, that goes into detail about the whole thing. Mhm. But Mar- but Marvel Universe was get, was going to be D- was going to be DOA. And the big re- I'd and I'd say the big reason for it is it being a diceless game. I think the mindset mm-hmm. that they had was because it's not going to use dice, it would be easier to approach. But diceless games ha- are are have a much bigger have a much bigger barrier for a lot of people because the idea yep. of the idea of rolling dice is so ingrained into the zeitgeist. Well, I still can't get I still can't get my head around amber. I can I can get I can get my head around it, but the fact that the the fact that you don't see as many diceless games as you do games with dice should tell should tell you exactly how much of a barrier there is. <laughs> but now I will I will admit that I that I came into things late when it comes to D one hundred lights. So, um, I would I would like to ask what the or, between the four D one hundred light games what the order of release was. I, mm-hmm. Frontier Space was obviously the first since you wanted it to wasn't, make a... believe it or not. Oh. No, no it so wasn't. so what happened was um I was doing all the Star Frontier stuff, mm-hmm. the, the Star Frontiersman and you know the digitally remastered stuff and I was doing all that and I had permission from Wizards of the Coast at the time. They said continue doing what you're doing until we say otherwise. And so I was doing it. I wasn't making a penny off it, just having fun, loving loving the hobby. And uh, then I got a cease and desist. Um, so I decided I, you know, by then I'd become fairly good at doing layout and art. I wasn't good at it then, but I was getting good at it, I guess. And uh, I, just, you know, just decided I wanted to make my own game system. So we started working on Frontier Space first, but we didn't release it first. Well, it's um, bare bones it fantasy was, first. Yes, sir. Bearboats Fantasy was the first game we released. I was working with a guy named Larry Moore, and Larry had the idea, hey, we have this big game, Frontier Space, but we know it's going to take a long time to, to you know, get out there. But I've, I've got an idea of how to just make a subset of the rules, a simpler, lighter set of the rules um, for a fantasy game. So I listened to him, and we started working on it together, and before we knew it, we had the whole game set up and play testing it like within a week. <laughs> because we had the game mechanics that we had been testing for a long time with Frontier Space. This was just a lighter version of them. Um, you know, the whole idea of skills with class type mm-hmm. structures and and very few ability scores and how they all work together. So we did a Barebones Fantasy first, and I was just amazed how fast that took off. I don't know if it was the game itself or if it was the... You know, we fit a lot of game in 80 pages. I mean, if you look through Barebones Fantasy, there's a lot in there. Um, And uh, we didn't do it by using a seven-point font. We did it just because we tried to word things concisely and, and, 
you know, okay, it's not perfect. I, we're one day going to do a second edition. We've had some work done on it to try to f correct things, but it really took off fast. And pretty soon there were other people producing content for it. Uh, lots of additional adventures were made, and some of them were published through us. Some of them were not. Um, and then after that, um, before we even moved on to do Frontier Space, finally, we, we went with Covert Ops. Mm. And Covert Ops was because spy stuff is my bread and butter. I, I, I love the spy genre. I, I read spy novels. I read, I watch spy movies. Um, any kind of espionage related stuff I'm, I'm just enamored with. I mean, the eighties were the best time for, for, for spy stuff, um, heavily inspired by the cold war. And I'm not a huge history buff, but I love spy history. And I visited museums that are devoted to spy history. I mean, I just love it all. And so I, I wrote uh, Covert Ops um, to try to simulate, you know, cinematic action adventure espionage type stories. And, I'm you know, I, I wasn't thinking James Bond because, you know, there's already a James Bond RPG. And I didn't want to make a super, like, lone character kind of RPG. You know, it was more like Mission Impossible. A whole group of individuals, each with a specialty, right? Yeah. So that that was covert ops, and then, and then I was uh, uh, working on Frontier Space, and then suddenly, James Spawn put out uh, uh, what was the name of his sci-fi RPG? Why am I not thinking of it right now? White something. White Star. Yeah. White. Yep. Yeah. Yep, and so he put that out, and it used this white box um, license that was a subset of the OGL. Um, and I'm like, you know what? That looks like you can wrap a game up pretty fast in in that kind of a of, of a license and that kind of construct. Sure, you're restricted by certain things you have to do, but so I thought, okay, I'm going to reach out to the OSR crowd, and I wrote White Lies, and I did that over a course of about a year and a half. And release that. And all the time, all this time, I was also producing supplements and adventures and things like that for the other games I'd released. Mm -hmm. And then the next one was finally Frontier Space. And Frontier Space, I thought, would have a bigger splash when it hit, just because I'd been working on it for so many years. <laughs> but uh, um, I don't know. It didn't. It didn't hit as hard as I would like. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's like platinum or mithril bestseller or whatever. I'm, I'm happy with its results. Um, I just didn't didn't I, I I dreamed of more grandiose response, and then uh, Jim Sales, uh, very creative fellow, someone I'm working with a lot lately, and who I call a friend. He approached me with the um, with his manuscript for Art of Wuxia, which he wrote due to his love for the genre. Um, I'm not a, as much of a huge fan of the genre, but that was the first time I really like stretched my layout skills and i think the book is a work of art in my opinion but oh, it, you know hell, it's my opinion <laughs> i i cert i certainly let i certainly enjoyed it and if, in my in my not so humble opinion i will not say no to the prospect of of more wuxia games in, out in the market because i've covered a ha i've covered a handful in in my, in my series um there's always one person in the comments who gets on me about my pronunciation. I usually tell them, um, if you want, if you want me to take your comments seriously, leave a comment in Mandarin Chinese. I don't speak <laughs> Mandarin Chinese, which is why I'd ask them to leave a comment in Mandarin Chinese. But I don't want, I don't want, I wouldn't want say Wandering Heroes of Ogre Gate to be the definitive Wuxia TTRPG G or something or something like that. Um, right. And well, Art of Wish, I think, hits it on the hits the nail on the head. He did a great job. It's yeah. his love for the genre is clear in that product, and I, I'm mm -hmm. ena ena enamored with it. Yeah, the now one 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 particular motif that is in is in a fair is in a fair few of the of the games that I always found interesting is treat is titling your sk titling your skills as classes. Mhm. Mm yeah, that's uh, what I do. It's my thang. 
So I'm curious how that how that kind of idea came about. Was there, yeah. was there an early draft that had more traditional skill lists or something yeah, like that? Yeah, absolutely. So what happens what happened was the first draft of Frontier Space that we were working on at the time each of the sk skills that you see today in Frontier Space actually had eight sub-skills. And those eight sub-skills were the actual skills. So we, we, the, the skill names that we see today were actually just categories that grouped the skills. And we, it was kind of a stretch for us to fill eight for every category. Some of them we, we had to categorize and truncate to try to make eight only, right? But other categories... It was a stretch to try to make eight happen. So then, you know, we started realizing, hey, this is kind of silly. Um, if we want a faster moving experience, then juggling all these individual, like we couldn't even remember all the skill names. Um, we, we, we said, well, why don't we just have one score for the whole group and say these are the kind of things you can do with them. And because at that time we had named the categories kind of like classes so mm -hmm. you know you had you had your soldier skills and you had your your um you know your academic skills and and your scientist skills and things like that that it's just it, the, that became the actual skill and then over time we you know even today we when we publish these games like if you look at covert ops they list four subcategorical things that you can do with the skill but over time, we kind of don't even use those. At the table, you're just, you, you know, you have a, you know, a 60 65% soldier skill, and we know what that applies to, everything a soldier does, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of the direction I went with, uh, with Frontier Space is let's just, you know, sort of push out all the sub-skilled sub-definitions and just instead describe in a paragraph what the skill entails and the fact that it's named like a class is kind of irrelevant but it also is descriptive it kind of tells somebody a classification of skill type activities that you could do with that score the i can only speak for myself but what i enjoyed out of it, out of it for me is the is the fact that you don't have the same tr you don't fall into the same trap that a lot of games with skill lists can fall into, especially a lot of the games that came that were messing were messing around with skill lists back in the nineties. Yeah, because you run into situations where there's something you need to do and there's no skill for it. Or in some cases, the you you try and you try and cover as many skills as possible, and it gets excessive. Sure, you um, have a sixty-four skill list like GURPS or something. Where it's uh, you know a long, multi-page printout, or the sk or the skill list for Phoenix Command, which I, which can best be described as yes. How many <laughs> skill how many skill lists how many skills do you have in your character sheet? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. So the whole idea, and again, I don't know if I mentioned this. I'm a I'm an engineer by trade, and you know when writing software or designing a a, a machine or a, or, or a human machine interface or anything like that or a robotic situation, you always have to think categorically because there's so many little things that you have to categorize and organize. And so when I, just like when writing a program, right? Mm -hmm. Who hasn't written a program? Those of us that have been around since the 80s. I... <laughs> <laughs> At least one program you've written. Come on, and, I have. And <laughs> I have. One, I have one infamous progr program story. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that when you write a program and it's going to be robust and used by industry, you think categorically and you create subroutines first to do repetitive tasks and you organize yourself. Mm -hmm. So when when creating skills for the, for any RPG or when creating the attribute set, I have a method for that too. I have a categoric like process I go through and to the best of my ability I think categorically and I think that's a better way to be comprehensive mm -hmm. and when it now one thing one thing that I am I'm curious about in terms of um, in terms of how you how you've handled it is what prompt 
in covert ops there's one particular um concept in there that is mar that is um martial maneuvers mm -hmm. um what prompted the idea of the idea of putting that in because that was that's something that was not to my to my knowledge it's it, i may have to refresh things but i don't i don't recall that being in um fr in frontier space yeah, so it was not in in bare bones fantasy, and it mm -hmm. it it does have a place in frontier space slightly differently, um, but in covert ops, you know, the genre involves a lot of action adventure. So, you know, having having a bunch of martial maneuvers just gave life to the martial arts skill, because mm -hmm. otherwise you can't have a whole skill called martial arts and just have it be for punching. You know. So you have this skill that gives you this this whole structure of branched things, and you know it. It also became the launching point for how things were organized for for Art of Wusha, and it inspired Jim to create that whole game. He said that he got inspired by it because of one little side note in in the Covert Ops game that was a suggestion, a side suggestion that says, "Hey, um, you don't have to just let players pick whatever martial maneuver they want when they level up." Um, you could create styles and predefine the maneuvers that they will get um, and create a number of styles that are taught, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what, that was his inspiration to say, you know what, this is perfect for making a Wusha game. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, But yeah, in, in Frontier Space, though, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but in Frontier Space, we have a similar concept. We have um, every, every skill... Um, you can buy skill benefits, and the skill benefits kind of serve a similar purpose, but work in every skill. Every skill has a small, very small list of skill benefits you can buy. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm certainly cool with cool with that, since it gives, it gives a reason to invest in a skill that's be, that's more than just numbers go up. Right. I know, I know some, I know, which is part of the, is part of the reason why I've had a, I've had a massive bone to pick with how a lot of people handle the idea of a fighter. You know, the, you know, the stereotype of fighter being just, ba being just basic attack, which is mm -hmm. where you get the problem of, uh, martial characters being Babby's first character and casters are supposed to be the system mastery character. <laughs> oh. I know some people right. say. I know some people say. Well, fighters aren't supposed to, aren't supposed to be more powerful than mages. Of that, if that's the case, why why is Conan kicking kicking um, sorcerers' asses every every time he beats them? <laughs> that's right. And well, I, I'll say that I I my favorite type of character class to play is a simple fighter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that's weird to say when you just describe that, but it's true. I think you know the story comes from your character background and the, the 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 story that unfolds for you. And to be honest, it's kind of fun because you know I grew up a little wimpy kid. I, I the idea of being able to you know make a threat and 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 back it up, hell yeah. For me, and this this is another bit. This is another bit of of uh, my gaming philosophy is, um. I don't like the idea of na of narrative and mechanics being segregated from each other. Mm -hmm. Not that I feel I feel like they should have kind of a yin yang relationship. That's co that's complementary to each other, or one one feeds into the other. And I I suppose a, I suppose a good example of this is cons let's let's say that it, let's say that in a campaign you have. A, you have a um, XP of Excalibur, the good old, the good old sword in the stone. Mm -hmm. You this this sword. Actually, I'll scratch Excalibur. Let me use a bet. Let me use a more a better example. The Master Sword from the Legend of Zelda games. The okay. The, the sword. The sword of the Hero of Time. The Blade of Evil's Bane. The this sword that has this. Massive lineage going going back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. You take all of that and you just ma and you just make it plus one to attack. Bit of mm -hmm. a disconnect there. Agreed. 
But, you know, I don't know. Is that a failure of storytelling? Is that a failure of game mechanics? Or is it a failure of a GM assigning such story significance to something that was minimal? <laughs> That's a good question. The answer is yes. <laughs> if, I'm if just it was... saying a good GM wouldn't do that, right? <laughs> yeah, a good, a good GM wouldn't do that. A bad designer would. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Nine. Yeah, I know what you mean. And, you know, in, in my D00 products, my D100 products, they have, um, I use these this concept called descriptors. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a non-game mechanical concept um, where when you make your character, you have to specify two descriptors. One that's a beneficial thing to say about your character and one that's a fairly baneful thing. Like, say, I don't know. Good with the ladies. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, uh, hubris will be my downfall. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. And in every game session, you know, there's no game mechanical benefit to these, to these descriptors. But there's a huge benefit because at the end of the session, when the GM is doling out your uh, uh, development points or experience points, whatever you want to call them, Mm -hmm. um, they, there's a, a list of categories that you go through, a little punch list that says if they did this, then they get one experience point. If they did this, they get one experience point. If they did this, they get a one experience point. And one of them is they get an experience point if they just demonstrated one or more of their descriptors. So you're rewarded for consistency of your character design. And in the end those descriptors end up making you better as a character because you're developing your character and raising up in levels with those, you know, development points. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a very simple way to implement character concept into the game mechanics without making it mechanical. Yeah. And I'm, of course, of course, even with... I use that magic item description because everybody's at least familiar with Legend of Zelda in one form or another. Mm -hmm. oh. Lots of weekends spent playing Zelda. <laughs> and, for, and for me, lo lots, of week lots of weekends um, de dealing, with, dealing with the absolute bullshit that was Death Mountain in Zelda 2. <laughs> I didn't play Zelda 2. Zelda 2 is not a is not a bad game. It just ha it just has some moments of what of what we like to call handbreaking. Also known as guide damn it. And <laughs> Death Mountain in Zelda 2 was one of them because <laughs> unless you unless you had Nintendo unless you had Nintendo Power, which at the time I didn't. Mm -hmm. There was no the best way you were going to navigate through that thing was guessing, and I don't like I don't like that. <laughs> King's Quest <laughs> well, is keep, my whipping keep guessing until you get to move forward. Right, that's how the game works. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure Sierra said the exact same thing with all the bullshit in King's Quest. <laughs> and I'm, I'm I used to. I, you ever hear of uh, the Wizardry series of games? Wizardry. Oh, oh yeah, I've I've talked I've talked about it, I've talked about it plenty of times on this channel and oh how that's awesome how important Wizardry is as a historian, especially. So I I used to work for Sir Tech Software. That was mm -hmm. that was my first uh, tech job that I ever had, and uh, they were they were developing uh, Jagged Alliance and Jagged Alliance Two Deadly Games and and Wizardry Eight. They were working on at the time. And, uh, yeah, so a lot of, there's this whole group of kids that they hired that were sitting in these cubicles and they would get these phone calls and it was people like people asking like for, for support, like how to get past levels in the game. And I'm like, I didn't even know that existed. Like you could call a helpline to get help getting through a level. Have you ever I heard the story of call Apogee, say Ardwolf? No. <laughs> Uh, this was a contest that ap that um ap Apogee and it Apogee and id had a had a kind of joint of the hip relationship in the in the early days and they there was they were going to do a contest where in a certain in a certain maze in Wolfenstein 3D you 
you if you if you moved push walls exactly, you'd find you'd find a place that would say call Apogee, say Ardwolf, because everybody had that kind of service hotline. Mm-hmm. The problem is by the time they had, they couldn't even put the thing in before the game came out, because people had already built level editors and um had fi- and had figured it out. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, sometimes you, despite your best planning, obsolescence screws you, right? So that's the same idea with my work at at uh, Surtech Software. What I was doing is writing the installers for the games. Um, you know, like, you know, doing all the registry entries, finding out what operating system it was, you know, setting everything up, um, putting the icons on the desktop, all the all that kind of crap, and you know you so i would get calls sometimes that were like tech support calls that were they weren't like how do i get the ogre out of this room so i can get into the next room <laughs> you know it was hey you i installed your game and now my computer won't read yeah. those were the days man but um i ended up co- i ended up cover there i've fan- i fancied myself i have fancied myself a bit of a historian and a lot and a lot of people, um, when it comes to when it comes, because I do ex- I do explain to some folk why I do not like the phrase JRPG, and in the process had to go into the history of video game RPGs, and also why a lot of people who think that you shouldn't be drawing inspiration from video games for tabletop don't know their history. I mean the, mm-hmm. the has has everyone just conveniently forgotten about the SSI era? <laughs> But kind of, I did with, until just now when you said it. <laughs> but I remember the whole Gold Box series of games. Yeah, those were great. But with and even and even that, I will note that one of the earliest CR, one of the earliest computer RPGs was in was on the Plato engine, um, ba- or Plato um s- platform back in the seventies. Um, but. Wizardry had Wiz, Wizardry is kind of the patient zero for what people call the JRPG because it did really well in Japan mm-hmm. to the point where games like the Black Onyx started coming out, which was basically a Japanese knockoff of Wizardry. Oh yeah, I remember it. And <laughs> eventually, um, Yuji Horii was approached by Enix. Say, saying that they wanted something like Wizardry, but streamlined for the family computer, i.e. Famicom, i.e. the NES. Mm-hmm. And that's how we get Dragon Quest. Mm. So, and a lot, a lot of, a lot of those steps, a lot of people, a lot of people kind of forget, or in the or um in the case of the history of online games for. Um, some people forget that technically, mu- technically, MUDs started as started as an unlicensed fork of um, Zork. <laughs> Zork. Yeah, there, there's an old one. I'm pretty sure you you. Oh yeah, I you played that. In a while. But MUD, which was short for multi-user dungeon, was based dungeon, on yep. Dungeon, which was an unlicensed port of Zork. I never played it. I don't. I don't know that I ever heard of it. Uh, I do remember. Pl- I do remember playing through my fair share of muds, which was like, which was like an MMO, but entirely text-based. That's to selling the whole thing short, but that's the best way for me to um, summarize it. Okay, wait. I did play something like that. It was like I played it on like a bulletin board service, like back before there was an internet. Yeah, that that. It was all text. Yeah. That tent that was how these kind of things were that was how these kind of worked. It um, was the land the land of N A I V it was called and it was it was programmed by some dude who who uh owned a pizza shop mm-hmm. in my hometown. <laughs> yeah. And N A stood for no anchovies and I V was the fourth version of his game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now when it came to designing um 
when it came to this, when it came to do it, when it came to doing this, des doing design of bare bones fantasy, mm -hmm. um, how easy or difficult was it to try to try and build a spell system? Since obviously there's not really a spell system in in um star in Star Frontiers that could be built around. Right. Well, again, for a it, when we decided to try to make a really light game and try to fit as much game as we could in a small package the original package was literally supposed to fit in a deck of cards box. That's what we were aiming for. We failed at that because we didn't think it would work and it was too clunky and, you know, gimmicky. Um, but at that time, we tried to fit every spell on a card. And we didn't want to make too many of them because we had to make this whole game fit in a card box. Hmm. And that's when I started applying, you know, back to the idea of categorical thinking where we don't need a hundred different offensive strike type spells. We don't need a lightning bolt, a fireball, a, you know, what have you. We can just have one spell called offensive strike that the, that the, uh, you know, the, the caster flavors with whatever element or, or need he has at that moment. And so that gave birth to us thinking categorically for all the other spells as well. So every spell description could fit with nine point font on a card on a playing card and that's how we how we designed the whole spell system was going through the the you know player's handbook of D and D and going through pathfinder at the time uh had just come out the new the first edition of course mm -hmm. um and we were just you know browsing through every spell and saying okay what categorically does that fit in in our in our in our game it, it it doesn't fit in any of them okay do we need a new category i don't know let's make a note of it and we'll come back to it and then after a while we come back and we say oh we have a whole bunch that seem related to charm and dominion let's put them all together you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so ultimately we tried to categorize spells and magical effects into a handful of specific categorical spell types mm -hmm. and and that's the way we the way we approached it. Now, I will say we did a lot of playtesting on like low rank characters, rank one, two, three, and that was because we played it at a lot of game conventions. And I don't know, people who might be listening to this at some point might be one of those people mm -hmm. that we played with. Um, but I have to say we did not do a lot of playtesting past third third level. So once skills get past third level, most of them seem to do just fine. But spellcaster sort of starts to break. <laughs> So that's one of the goals of of uh, of doing a second edition at some point is to tighten up the up the higher level play now that we have a lot more experience with it. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because I've I have talked about in the past of, on the the issue the issue of high, of high level play in some mm -hmm. in, in some games, especially games that ha and I will I will note there's the caveat of this is. Specifically around games that use some sort of level system. If it's if it's a level list system and a classless system, um, those are you're gonna have pe you're gonna have people find some way to break it no matter what you do. So, be so best to not try and swim up river. But a lot of I'd say a good a good amount of the reason why there's this stereotype of high level is boring is. A hyper focus on the new player experience to a, to a certain to a certain extent, and not and not a, not a whole lot on the experience of turning newbies into experts. I'm not saying that's the ca that's the case with any of the D100 light games, but that's a pa that's a pattern that I've observed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. If I I don't know if that's true here or not, to be perfectly honest. I just know that we tried really hard to try to encapsulate, you know, all of the magic spells that we could from every game type. I mean, I even grabbed the old um, magic law, arms law, and claw law from uh, uh, RuneQuest or whatever the heck it was it that I had laying around. It was, what was it? It was Rollmaster. Uh, Rollmaster, that was it. Which... I had that, and I was looking through it, and I had some other magic book from from that game, and I was looking through that. And we're trying to find every possible spell every RPG ever put out, and there's a place for every one of them in in this spell list, mm -hmm. plus a couple other spell list, uh, a couple other spells that we published subsequently in uh, in some uh, webzines that we that we put out. The funny, uh, but a couple of them are very broken though. Like summon is kind of broken. It, cre <laughs> it 
creates a mess. Um, telekinesis is fine. There's just a handful of these that are truly broken. Offensive strike is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I dis I distinctly I distinctly recall doing a doing a little experiment on the ratio of spell pages to to, to total book. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, barebones fantasy is at the low end of of that. Yeah, I think we have like four pages. Two, three, um, four. The, cause okay, the, we have five pages of spells in an eighty-page book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the if you the whole idea is take the number of total pages in in the book and co its core book only, and obviously it ha obviously obviously, and the amount of just descriptions of individual spells, not the mm -hmm. mechanics of the spell casting system or anything like that, just the spells. Mm -hmm. Um. If you had to hazard a guess, what what um, fantasy game would you say would be the biggest offender? Well, I'd say that GURPS handles every finite little spell completely uniquely and differently, and you have to go to the damn book for every spell. Actually, GURPS was on the low end of things as far was as it page really? count. Was like, it really? Oh, if it's if we're just talking page count. I don't know. Would it be D and D? I mean, the player's handbook is like it's, fifty percent spells. It's a two-way tie between D and D three point five and Pathfinder. Okay. Pathfinder yeah, that's believable. Beats it out. Pathfinder first edition beats it out barely. And truth be told, a lot a lot of the spells are ridiculously redundant. Like, do we do we really need eighteen different versions of protection from? Right, right. That's why I have one protection spell that you specify the effect of when you cast it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, th I think this, this. Plus, there, there's been a lot of spells that the sole reason they exist is to, de is to, deal with or negate other spells. Oh, sure. Or yeah, light, light, and darkness. Nobody's casting globe of darkness. Not when there's other spells that can blind people with a power word. <laughs> I I did have a, I did have a Gish character that used Globe of Darkness, but only only because that was part of his his strategy to create dark areas and then backstab people. Mm -hmm. Or cre or create dark or create dark areas while he while he himself has dark vision, and um and start and start um firing magic missiles at them. Well, that works if you're in a enclosed area or something, but mm -hmm. if you're in a broad battlefield or something, it's kind of useless because people are moving and you got terrain or moving around you. Mm -hmm. There's that's what I'm saying. There's so many better spells if you want to accomplish a similar yeah. effect. There's invisibility. There's improved invisibility. There's <laughs> which as an I when it comes to that whole redundancy, I may as well add the. This is the this is the same as this other spell, just a improved version of it. Yeah, right, like you couldn't get to an improved version just by being a higher level if it was a well designed spell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know people are people are going to be I, the with with a project that I'm working on. The approach that we have with those kind of tiered spells is that is the difference is is not in overall power, but in but in um, area of effect. Mm-hmm. Because the the actual level of the spell can can is a slideable affair. It just depends on how much you want to spend. So it's a mana system or a magic point system. Yeah, yeah. Not, I like those. I haven't ever developed a game with one yet, but I like them in 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 video games and things. So one day I will. And I and you know I've, I've been working on on. A, go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a bit. I have a bit of a confession to make. I hate the uh -huh. Vancean model. I have hated it since That's I started. Nothing wrong with that. Since I started, um, and a big reason, a big reason why is, bec is because of the fact that the settings that it's placed in, especially in more in more po in more ubiquitous fantasy games, doesn't doesn't warrant it. Mm -hmm. Like Jack Vance's Dying Earth books have it where magic is this form of mathematics that people. That um is hard to is hard to understand for a lot of people. You know some Clark's Law stuff. Mm -hmm. 
but why is that? Why is but that's in a sword and sorcery kind of setting. Not that's that doesn't really fit in a high fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. Unless it, it it you have the issue of how do you narratively justify when you're out of when you're out of spells, as say a wizard or a sorcerer, right? A cleric you ha cleric has a has an easy excuse. Your god only gave you a certain number of spells. <laughs> yeah, you can just say because God wills it. Because your God wills it. Yeah, which yeah. bit of an ass pull, but doable. Sure. But for a wizard who gets all their magic from from intense study. Right. No mana points work totally well for me in my head. That mm -hmm. works great. Um, there's other ways to accomplish it with you know a score that is diminishing as you use it, so your ability to use it is only you know, getting more more and more stressed until you can rest. So that's another way to do it without mana points, which is something that we actually considered at one point for a second edition of Bare Bones Fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, I've something akin to a something akin to like a the, the multi action penalty we use yeah. where, you know, just every time you cast a spell you've now you know, exhausted your ability to cast spell, your access to the magic source by, you know, five points or something. I so will... now the next time you do, you got minus five to your percent chance. Yeah. And keep doing it all day and you're going to be out of magic for the day. I will admit I have a fondness for, you can cast that spell as many times as you want, but you're going to be getting tired every time you cast it. Mm hmm Yeah, that was one of the ways we were thinking about balancing BBF2. Oh. And then Spheres came along and said, "Why don't you? Why don't you? Why can't you have both?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like because I like Spheres of Power and its tradition system that basically divorces the idea that you have to have one um, set of rules for ma for magic. Mm -hmm. But with the it's it sounds it sounds like bare bones fantasy is the is the one that has occupied the most the most time in terms of things that could be improved or mm -hmm. were, were were there other things that can be improved moments with and with any of the other entries like frontier space or covert ops so frontier space i had this conundrum um bare bones fantasy was popular because i didn't have to explain what an elf was I didn't have to have to explain what a dwarf was. I didn't have to have any lengthy conversation about it, their culture or anything. I just said, this is a dwarf. These are the statistical differences between that and a human and that and an elf, you know? So I, I didn't have to rely on, on, on a bunch of extra stuff, but frontier space, what the only, the only thing that frustrated me was that I couldn't do that with aliens, you know, cause aliens are going to have to be unique. I can't just say this is a, an alien and these are its stats people are going to say yeah but look at that picture how does he eat or <laughs> or 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 uh you know how does he reproduce I, I don't know so um people needed to know more because they didn't know what a um you know what a what a yar is or what its culture was or why it had the abilities it had so we had to devote a lot of page count to stuff like that um which once you start doing that, you realize, okay, it's it doesn't feel light anymore because now I'm going to describe everything else that I'm that I did. So the only small frustration was that it became a bigger product than I intended it to be. I was hoping that it would fill, you know, the size of one of those two books, but when it got as big as it did, I realized I had to separate it into a referee and a player book. And there was some criticism over that. People said, you know, it's just a money grab or something. I'm like, no, it's not a money grab. I just, I, I don't want to burden you with having to buy a huge book for the, for the player who only needs this section. <laughs> it, what's, what's kind of, what's kind of funny is it's not too far removed from the player's guide thing that say Numenera does, which is the core book, but just, but just with all the DM stuff taken out. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much what 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 I needed. And then people would say I bought the player's handbook and I didn't realize I need the GM's guide too. Can I return it? I'm like, don't return it. Get the GM's book. 
So I would, you know, try to be nice and helpful, and I would hand out a coupon or something to them to try to take my profit off. I hardly make anything off my games. I don't know if you've looked at the prices I sell these things for, but I barely, I barely mark them up over the cost of the POD. And mm-hmm. you know, I I can't if if I personally won't spend more than nine dollars and ninety nine cents for any length PDF, I'm not going to expect anyone else to ever do so, right? Mm-hmm. I'll spend more for a book, especially if it's high quality. But for a PDF, come on. Yeah, and the there was a bit there. I do remember some people, some folks doing doing um, research on the spending habits and the me, the um, average when it comes to what people would spend on an individual PDF was somewhere between fifteen and twenty at most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have spent more than nine ninety nine. I'm just saying that's kind of like my limit of where I'll impulse buy a nine ninety nine or less game just to see what it's like. I won't do that with a game that's above that. I have to like research and see if it's really something I'll ever get to the table. You know, because if I want to bring it to the table, I don't keep it in PDF form. I got to print it out. I got to put it in a binder. Oh yeah. And with that, with that in mind, with all mm-hmm. with all of with all of that in with all of, the, of that in mind, it sounds it sounds like to me the um, the, the next major goal is do, is doing a would would you say a second edition or a revised edition of Bare Bones Fantasy? So actually, right now I have two what four I have four games in the works um, that I'm working on pretty diligently. People people think that I'm I'm not producing anymore. It's not that. It's just that I'm producing a lot of things and I I'm I'm deep into them all. So one of them is a Bare Bones Fantasy second edition, and I'm working with another guy named Eric Piper, who's who's uh you know fully in love with Bare Bones Fantasy and and wants to stay true to it, but also wants to fix things and also wants to expand it a little where we can. Um, and I'm better at layout and graphic design now, so you know he wants to take advantage of that too. Um, and then the second project is a um, this sounds sacrilegious, but we're making a a uh, a bear I haven't even announced this to anybody but it's a bare bones space it's um it's a it's another sci-fi game um that is not it's not focused on on um uh on trying to recreate the experience I had as a kid playing Star Frontiers like Frontier Space was Frontier Space is my my dream child of making a frontier, front, uh, Star Frontiers like game, and this is different. So, uh, bare bones space is meant to be a bare bones system, a very streamlined, small, light game without you know without a lot of additional content. Hopefully, going to fit in a book that about the size of front of uh, bare bones fantasy. And I'm working on that with Jim Sales, the guy who wrote Art of Usha. And we're very excited about that game, and it's coming along nicely. Um, and then the third project I'm working on is another love child of mine. I absolutely love pirate genre, and not just pirate genre like historic, although there's a lot of that as well in it, but like mul- mulching together the Sid Meier's Pirates, if you ever played that, which I, I did have. exhaustively. <laughs> um, I have it on Steam right now. Um, and uh, mixing that with... Uh, with uh uh you know board games like like merchants and marauders or um uh various other like uh i can't think of any of the novels i've read right now but pirates of the caribbean movies Mm -hmm. where there's a a supernatural element to it but still you know light and adventurous and uh i've been trying to work on this one for a long time i got the cover art already done i got the core mechanics built they're not d it's not d00 light it's it uses a 2d6 type mechanic where the the sixes are zeros so it's zero to five on the dice so you roll 2d and it gives you a number between zero and ten which is a uh, an easy number to grok on a scale of one to ten how fast am i right mm-hmm. and uh yeah so I'm working on those and then I'm also working right now on 
breaking white lies out of the OGL and SRD and white box um, uh, entrapment and just walking away from the OGL completely with it and sort of redesigning it as a as its own game system. It'll be a familiar game system, but it won't be based on D and D anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I will I will certainly be looking forward to it because there's because of how flexible the um, D one hundred light D one hundred light setup is. There's mm-hmm. a few ideas that I that I may end up exploring when I'm done with the major project I've been, I've been working on for the last year. But that's a, that's a whole other that's a whole other story. Uh, sure. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the particular bit of crazy that happens around here. <laughs> well, I was happy to come. It was a lot of fun. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I didn't even finish one beer, so... <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come, to come onto the temple and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!